Hello. Today we are continuing to look at life in Christ Church. Last week we saw the duties of the elders toward the members of the congregation and the requisite duties of the members also toward their elders. And today we're looking at the mutual duties that members have toward one another in the body of Christ. Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how we thank you and praise you that you have established your church here on earth, that Christ died for her, that indeed we are a part of the people of God. And so, Lord, we pray as we continue to look at life in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would grant us wisdom and grace and understanding. Please help us to put into practice the things that we see are taught here in the Word of God. We ask that you would forgive our sins. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hear the Word of God. I'm reading today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Amen. This is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he add his wonderful blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of it today. As he continues to address the Thessalonian Christians, Paul uses the term brethren. Now we exhort you, brethren. This is a, a warm family term, and Paul uses it here to remind them that they are united to one another and to him through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are, as Christians, all family, uh, part of the family of God. And so he's addressing the entire membership of the church there in Thessalonica, and not merely the elders when he uses this term, brethren. The pattern of godly biblical ministry is expressed by Paul in this particular way. Now, the church has historically had to deal with two extreme departures from the biblical model of ministry. On the one hand, there is what is known as clericalism, uh, that's a term that means that all of the ministry of the church is performed by an ordained clergy. An example of this would be the Roman Catholic Church where the ministry is performed by the priesthood. And basically the congregation uh, watch as things go on that uh, they can participate in but uh, really are participating in more as observers. On the other extreme, there is anti-clericalism. Uh, this is found in groups such as the Quakers, where there is no ordained ministry, and all of what passes for ministry in that church is done by laymen, and by laymen alone. They are not uh, ordained in any way. The biblical view is expressed by the Apostle Paul as a midway point between what we would call clericalism and anti-clericalism. This is expressed in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes, and he himself, talking about the risen Jesus Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, you'll notice that there is an important task that ordained officers do perform, and that uh, task is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so there is this uh, dual or uh, joint ministry that goes on in the church biblically where ordained officers have the task and responsibility of interpreting and understanding and teaching the Word of God to the layman, and it is the layman who are equipped by the Word of God and then sent forth to minister in uh, Christ's vineyard. Now, uh, in addition to this, this doesn't mean that uh, ordained men have nothing to do with the ministry at all, other than teaching, because we also are sheep of the shepherd. And so 
uh, we engage in that ministry together with uh, laymen as uh, all of us do the part that God has called us to do. Uh, he exhorts them, uh, Paul says. And that term exhortation is once again the same term that is the verb form that's related to the noun that describes the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And this verb means to be called alongside of someone to help that individual. Uh, it's encouragement in ministry that Paul is giving to these Thessalonian Christians in several different ways. He wants them to learn how to minister to one another, and he's going to explain those ways here. And so uh, Paul gives a command. Now, when he gives a command here, he is not departing from grace and going back to law in any way. Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that because we are saved entirely by the grace of God, that there are no obligations on the Christian life, and that's not true. It's not a return to the law whatsoever. We are saved by grace. We are justified by God's grace through faith in Christ. And we are sanctified by God's grace also. But that sanctification lives up to the commands that are given in Holy Scripture. And so our sanctification is designed by God Himself uh, and by, powered by the work of the Holy Spirit to bring us into line with those things that are taught in the Word of God. And so the commands of Scripture have a very important role to play in the lives of Christians as well. And that's what Paul is expressing here. What is this godly action that the Apostle Paul exhorts them to? Well, we read here, warn those who are unruly. And so this exhortation is a warning. And warn is the word that we saw already in verse 12 uh, that J. Adams translates confront nuthetically. Uh, this is nutheteo, and it's translated warn here. It is often translated admonish or counsel or comfort and so on. Uh, what J. Adams points out when he uses that term to confront nuthetically is that there are three aspects of this that need to be considered. The first is obviously confrontation. Uh, there is a confrontation that comes, and that confrontation comes because there is some problem or difficulty uh, or sin that has arisen in a person's life, uh, ongoing sin of some kind, or a failure to understand and apply what the Scriptures have to say in some regard. And this confrontation is done out of concern. In other words, the problem is affecting that individual, and uh, those who are confronting him are concerned about his departure from the truth. Uh, it could be that it's affecting that one individual, but because we are all part of the body of Christ, sin in one person begins to infect others around him. And so for the good of the individual, as well as for the good of the church of the Lord Jesus, uh, this person needs to be confronted out of concern, and the goal is change, biblical change, change to bring that person back into line with what the scriptures have to say regarding this sin or regarding this problem or misunderstanding. So here, the change that Paul envisions in the life of these folks uh, who are being unruly is that they be brought back into line. Now that term unruly comes from the military. It's a term that is used outside of Scripture to describe a, uh, an army, a, a number of soldiers who are marching uh, in line, and there's one person who is not, uh, who is marching completely out of cadence with everyone else. This is uh, Gomer Pyle marching along with the uh, Marine Corps where he's totally out of step with everything that's going on around him. And so this is the term that's used. He, this is a, a Christian that is completely out of step with the Bible, completely out of step with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some Bibles translate this word idle or lazy rather than unruly. And so what Paul is probably envisioning here is a person who has become idle and has become a busybody as a result of that. He's going to address that more fully in 2 Thessalonians. And so here there would be some folks that, uh, who are able-bodied but are refusing to work for whatever reason. Perhaps they're refusing to work because they think the second coming is so imminent, why bother? 
And what's happening in the meantime is as they sit back and wait for Jesus to return from heaven, they are mooching off of other Christians there in Thessalonica. And so we've got a group apparently of lazy good-for-nothings who are refusing to work and are disrupting the church by their idleness and by their unruliness. They are out of step with the Bible. They are out of step with others in the congregation. And therefore, they must be admonished. They must be confronted, counseled, and warned that their actions are not in accord with Christ's desire for their sanctification. Uh, this neuthetic confrontation then is supposed to bring them back into line with the rest of the body of Christ so that they are uh, returned to faithful service to the Lord Jesus Christ by this. The second exhortation that Paul gives to the members of the congregation here is comfort the faint-hearted. Now, he is exhorting them to comfort, which means to, to console, to encourage, and the people that need that encouragement are described as faint-hearted. That's a term that literally means little-souled. In other words, this is describing people who are fearful and are easily discouraged by circumstances around them. Now, don't forget, the Thessalonians were facing persecution at this time, persecution from outside of the church, uh, persecution from unbelievers, persecution as Paul did from unbelieving Jews as well as Gentiles. And so there were a number of them who apparently were wilting under the heat of such persecution. And therefore what Paul says to the rest of these folks is they are to take special notice of these uh, faint-hearted people and they are to come alongside of them and they are to offer them encouragement so that they would no longer be so fearful. Now, how do you do that? You do that by instruction in the promises of Almighty God, uh, the promises that the Lord Jesus Christ has given. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Lord says. Uh, Jesus uh, says that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And so there are many promises where God uh, establishes the fact that he will not forsake his people. And those who are fearful need to be reminded of this great promise. And also they need to be prayed for. It is obvious that uh, stronger Christians are to pray for these weaker, fearful Christians uh, to offer a prayer to God that God would fortify them, would encourage them, would strengthen them, would help them to understand that they can reliably lean upon him and he will take care of them. And so uh, they encourage through prayer as well. And also through the examples that they themselves set, that Paul has set and that other Christians set, of those who face this similar type of persecution and remain steadfast in the Lord by relying upon his grace in Christ. And so the examples of church history for us today are wonderful examples where we see not only the folks in the scripture and especially our Lord Jesus standing firm when tempted, but we also see down through church history ordinary Christians like we are who also have been given grace to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ and emerge victorious from such persecution. So those who are fearful, those who are afraid all the time, uh, those who are little souled, need such encouragement, they need such comfort, they need such counsel from others who are more mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul exhorts here in the second place. In the third place, the Apostle Paul exhorts the Thessalonians to uphold the weak. Now that word uphold literally means to lay hold of. It's talking about grasping someone and not letting go. When I was less than five years old, my family lived in a house that was on a busy street. And I don't remember this, but I remember my mother telling me the story of one day I had, was playing in the front yard. Uh, there was no barrier between the front yard and the, and the road. And apparently I had uh, knocked a ball into the street. And like little kids do, I ran after it uh, completely heedless of the fact that there was oncoming traffic. What happened next was amazing. A German shepherd that my mother said she had never seen in the uh, yard before, never seen in the neighborhood at all, darted out between my house and the house next door 
and grabbed hold of my shirt collar with its teeth and pulled me back away from the street. Uh, it was uh, obviously uh, an intervention of the Lord in uh, preventing me from being run over and killed at that particular moment. Uh, a wonderful blessing. And uh, yet the example that I'm giving here is that animal would not let go of my shirt collar until I was safely back in the yard uh, and then uh, stood there to protect me from my mother who was upset. Uh, she had to go back inside and close the screen door before the dog disappeared and, and uh, I came back in. But we are to lay hold of weak Christians. What Paul is, is saying here is that stronger Christians are to lay hold of weak Christians and not let them go. Uh, go. Uh, it is the, the case uh, of grabbing hold of those who are finding it difficult to uh, abandon sin in their life or to resist temptation in some way. And so we're talking here about uh, believers in Christ, but those who struggle continually with sin, who have a, a very difficult time of it. And so those who are stronger Christians are exhorted, don't just abandon them, don't tell them stop it, and then when they don't stop it because they're struggling and don't know how or what to do exactly, uh, then say, well, I, I told you to stop it. I'm washing my hands of the whole thing. You're on your own now. No, that's not the Christian attitude. Rather, stronger Christians are to take special notice of this, and we are called upon to lay hold of those who struggle with sin on a daily basis and not let them go. We lay hold of them uh, by upholding them in prayer before God, uh, praying continually for them. We lay hold of them by committing ourselves to help those individuals and not just uh, uh, cleansing our hands of the whole business, but rather uh, getting into the trenches there with them and committing ourselves to helping those individuals. And so that's the way that we are to treat those in our day, for example, who are caught up in substance abuse or who are caught up in some life-dominating sin of some kind. Strong Christians have an obligation before God to lay hold of weak believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who are struggling daily with their sin in, in their lives and not let them go, to uphold them in prayer, to hold on to them faithfully and to admonish, exhort, and to help and to comfort, uh, but to be with them so that uh, we do not simply abandon them to their sin. And next, Paul exhorts them with this very general exhortation, be patient with all. Now that term patient is sometimes translated in Bibles as be long-suffering. And it has to do with putting up with those who are very, very difficult. God himself is long-suffering with us. He puts up with our sin. And so uh, we are exhorted to put up with, uh, to... Uh, indeed uh, be long-suffering toward all. Now, what he's getting at there is that unless and until a person has rejected all admonition and all attempts at church discipline uh, and has come to the point where he has hard-heartedly refused to hear and to heed the counsel of the church, then we are called upon by God to bear with that individual in all manner of failings and in all manner of weaknesses. I mean, after all, think how much the Lord puts up with you and me. Uh, we sin against God on a daily basis, and God is long-suffering toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so He puts up with our failures. He puts up with our weaknesses. He puts up with our sins and is in the process of sanctifying us to deliver us from those things. And so we ought to be willing to continue to do that as well. Now, the point is, until a person rejects your offer of help, we are to put up with that one in love in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if he has rejected such help, we are surely to continue to pray for him. And even if he has been put through church discipline, and has been cast out of the church, we are still to pray to God that God would bring that one back to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would bring him back to himself through repentance and through faith. 
So as long as that individual is still alive, we should pray for his return to the Lord, and we should also stand ready to forgive that person when he does repent and when he does return to Christ. Uh, we should always be ready. As, as uh, Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times a day. And Jesus' remark was, no, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. And he's not setting a number of 490 times per day. Uh, he is giving that as an illustration of every time ought to be as the first time. You ought to stand ready to forgive. And so in a situation like this, we are to put up with, we are to be long-suffering toward those, praying for their repentance, praying for their return to the Lord. That is our Christian obligation. And finally, Paul gives a two-part exhortation here, uh, the, a negative side and a positive side. The negative side is to forbid revenge. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, Paul says. We're not to seek revenge from those who have done us wrong in some way. Now, the world often thinks in terms of revenge or in terms of getting even uh, against those who have done us wrong in some way. Uh, think about Hollywood movies that would not even exist if it were not for a revenge motive of some kind. You wouldn't have four John Wick movies if they hadn't killed his dog. And so there are all kinds of motives for revenge that the world sees and wants to take revenge on uh, evildoers or someone who has done evil to me. But we Christians are called upon by God to live by a different standard. We are not to seek revenge. We're called upon instead to imitate our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that he was totally different in this regard. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, who, Jesus, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Think about that. On the cross, Jesus had been uh, arrested falsely. He had been beaten. He had been spat upon. Uh, there was blood flowing down from his head where they had placed a crown of thorns on his head and beat him uh, with a stick. And uh, he had been treated in horrible ways. And now he's on the cross. He's uh, being crucified. Uh, the crowds below are, are booing and hissing and calling him names, uh, telling him, come down from the cross and we'll believe in you. Even the two thieves uh, crucified on either side began uh, to revile him at the very first. What was Jesus' response? Jesus did not curse them from the cross. Instead, we find Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so we see Jesus, in the midst of all of this suffering, did not revile those who reviled him. He did not curse those who cursed him. Uh, he instead committed himself to the Lord and asked God to forgive those who were killing him. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul uh, says the same thing that he says here, but in a little bit more detail. At the end of Romans chapter 12, we read these words. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so Paul is giving greater detail there where he's telling us the way in which we are to act. We are to act rather than in a negative way of seeking revenge. We are to seek good. We are to overcome those evil actions with the good of the way that we respond to them. And then Paul states this in the positive way of saying, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. And so he tells us, tells the Thessalonians that they are to pursue what is good. That word pursue is a term that speaks of a hunter who is pursuing 
his prey. He is uh, chasing after that prey. Uh, it's a word that is said in the continuous present, which means that at all times, without stopping, Christians are to chase after that which is good. Now, good, of course, is defined by God in His Word. It's not defined by you or by me. Uh, the lie of the devil in the Garden of Eden was to tell Eve and Adam, who was there with her, uh, that they could determine for themselves what was good and what was evil. They could determine for themselves right and wrong without any reference to God whatsoever. And so we need to remember that good is defined by the Creator. It's defined by God and not by the creature, by Satan or by man at all. Uh, you are not the measure of what is good for you, nor are you the measure of what is good for anyone else. Only God determines what is good. Uh, that means that, for example, some people today may think it's good to tell little girls that they can become little boys or little boys that they can become little girls. But God's Word says that in the beginning, God made them male and female. And so it is good, therefore, not to feed a lie to those who are confused, but rather to state the truth as God reveals that truth in Holy Scripture. The Apostle Paul wrote long ago to these Thessalonian Christians who were struggling to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ in the face of persecution all around them and also in the face of sin within the church itself. He told the members of that congregation that they were to minister to each other, they were to help each other grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were to help each other resist the temptations to sin and the temptations to turn back into a sinful lifestyle, that they are uh, to resist the temptation to give up on the faith, and they're to resist the temptation to seek revenge against anyone whatsoever. And you and I need those exhortations today also. We have the same kinds of problems today as they had back then. And the solution is exactly the same for you and me as it was for the Thessalonian Christians almost 2,000 years ago. And that is primarily we need the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and secondarily, we need one another in the Lord Jesus Christ. We as Christians are called upon to strive to live godly lives for the glory of God in a sinful fallen world, and we need the help of each other to be able to do that as well. But most of all, what we need is Jesus. And so the question before you today is, do you know this Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Savior? Has he delivered you from sin? Are you repentant, and are you seeking to live a life that glorifies God through faith in Jesus Christ. If you are not and have not, I urge you now, turn from your sin and trust in Jesus and you will find salvation. But if you are a Christian today, then I urge you also to seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as you serve your fellow believers in Him on a daily basis. Let us pray once more. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for these exhortations that your servant Paul gave to the Thessalonian Christians long ago. We thank you that they apply to us equally well today. And so, Father, I pray that we would take them to heart, that we would see our mutual ministry toward one another, its necessity within the body of Christ, and that we would be engaged in doing those very things. And for any who are apart from Christ right now, who do not know the Savior. I pray that you might open such a person's heart to believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ even today. Please forgive our sins and bless us uh, to mutually support and sustain one another in Christ as we seek to live for him in this fallen world. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to bringing the word of God again next time.